All righty. What's up, everybody? Um, super excited to have the one, the only John Blair uh, from Free to Grow, CFO, uh, on our call today. John, thank you so much for coming on board. Why don't you uh, introduce yourself to everybody? Uh, tell them a little bit about what you do as well. Awesome. Yeah, super stoked to be here. Thanks for having me here, Daniel. Um, so I'm John Blair, um, or I guess on LinkedIn, you can see there below me, Jonathan Blair, T-H-O-N, not A-N. Don't make that mistake. That one happens a lot. Uh, John Blair, founder and fractional CFO at Free to Grow CFO. Um, you know, just a little bit about me. Um, I've only been on the consulting side of the world for less than a year and a half. Before this, I've been on the brand side my whole career. Um, most recently was a founding team member of a company called Guardian Bikes, which was a, is a D2C um, kids bike brand that sells the safest kids bikes direct to your door. May have seen us on Shark Tank, um, took a, uh, an investment from Mark Cuban. And uh, you know during the time of, of working on the founding team, um, served as COO and CFO, handled all aspects of operations and finance and helped scale that business from pre-revenue to healthy eight figures in a very short amount of time, just three years. And so um, in terms of having a discussion about scaling smart and quickly, you know, that's, that's my, on the brand side, that's my primary experience. And, and since, and uh, you know, a little less than a year and a half ago, decided to um, package up what I had learned at Guardian Bikes and provide it uh, fractional CFO services to growing direct to consumer brands so that founders of fast growing brands can access the advice and the expertise that they need to scale alongside healthy profit, cash flow, and confidence, but without the price tag of hiring a full-time CFO. So that's a little bit about me and what we do over here. That's awesome. Yeah, we'd love to, uh, you need a John in your life for sure. Uh, I'm sure you're also the one that is the, uh, keeps people in check. Uh, if you are at a fast growing, uh, company, which is, which is key, right? I can't tell you how important it is to know, like, it's not just about growing top line revenue, but it's about your cash flow. It's about making sure you're actually making money. Um, you know, we've, we've had, uh, I definitely audited accounts where they're doing a couple million dollars a year, uh, plus in, in revenue. And then they think they're making money, but at the end of the day, they're actually selling items for a loss or things like that. Cause they're not building out a proper P and L and all of these kind of pieces here. So, um, I think just starting off, you know, foundationally, like who should be thinking about having, uh, like a CFO, you know, as, as in regards to business, right. I know we've got some businesses on here that are obviously on the larger side. Uh, but we've got folks that are, you know, small, scrappy, they're building up, you know, when is the right time to start thinking about your financials? Yeah, that's a good question that I get a lot. Um, and so here's the thing, what I observed while I was scaling guardian bikes is that, um, fast growing brands, uh, need a CFO before they can afford one full time. And unfortunately, their bookkeeper and their accountant, um, they're not tooled up to provide the CFO insights that are needed. Um, and so really what the dilemma is, is like, hey, look, I don't have enough in my budget to afford that full, you know, um, full time CFO, you know, price tag, but I really need that advice and that expertise. And so one thing I like to kind of level set on with people when talking about when do I need a CFO is to understand the difference between what a CFO does and what an accountant or a bookkeeper does. An accountant and a bookkeeper, they focus on recording with accuracy and reporting what has already happened. A CFO helps you plan out the future. So it's the forward looking perspective as opposed to the historical looking perspective. And um, what I found in the uh, kind of you know, even though we're kind of, we're talking more in like a D to C uh, perspective, I want to break it down into kind of two major subsets. When we're talking about a service business that's growing, they tend to need a CFO at about two to 3 million in revenue. And they tend to have about 20 ish employees. Once you kind of break 20, 25 employees, you, the, the, the finances become a lot more complicated and you really need a CFO to help you plan out the future and to achieve your goals from a, from a uh, consumer brand standpoint, I tend to see it, you know, on average around about 5 million in, in revenue. But the reason why I say about is because there are some brands that need a CFO before 5 million in revenue. 
the, you know, sometimes two and a half, three, four million. And really what the nuance is, is like how complicated the cash flow um, equation is for a given brand. Some brands have easier cash flow equations than others. So for example, if you're just buying finished goods from a contract manufacturer, it tends to be easier to manage cash flow than if you're manufacturing those goods yourself. So a manufacturing business probably needs a CFO pre 5 million in revenue, but one that's purchasing finished goods can probably wait till they hit about 5 million. So again, in summary, um, CFOs help you achieve your goals, help you plan out the future. Accountants help you look into the past and understand what has happened. You need a CFO once cash management is getting too complicated and you cannot, the cash does not equal your PL profit and loss. And when you no longer have a handle on being able to plan ahead and um, plan out how the future and how you're going to achieve your goals. I think that's a super simplified version of, of what you do uh, there. And I think that, uh, that that's really helpful. Like I like the, uh, the statement you, you utilize in regards to like when your P and L doesn't match your cash cash flow anymore. Uh, but I know that's a huge, huge thing for businesses, uh, especially right now with the economy, like cash is a little bit harder to get um, there. So cash flow has just become, you know, even more important um, these days. What do you typically see as like a common mistake that brands are making when it comes to, you know, improving their cash flow or why their, their cash flow isn't matching their, their P and L typically? So in a uh, consumer brands and D to C brand context, um, it, Oftentimes, I would say most frequently, it, it sits in the inventory management side of cash flow. So just as like a really high level kind of cash flow 101, your cash flow is driven by how profitable you are and then the impact of what's called your cash conversion cycle. And what, what impacts your cash conversion cycle is your inventory efficiency, your accounts receivable efficiency, and how fast you pay your AP. And so on the D to C brand context, I almost always see the biggest cash flow issue in inventory management and what's called days inventory on hand. Um, I'd say the most common uh, kind of general mistake I see made on inventory management side of things is that brands get really concerned about missing out on leaving sales on the table by missing out on capturing upside right? And so they'll over order kind of out of fear and out of emotion and not think about what position that's going to put their cash flow in if they don't hit those upside revenue targets. There's a, we could actually camp on this and literally talk about this for the rest of our time today. But um, what I've learned over the years, I made a few of these mistakes at Guardian Bikes where we, we had some very promising marketing campaigns that we thought were going to hit certain numbers. Or actually the most challenging thing is gearing up for the holiday season because almost every d to c brand you're in the consumer space q4 is your super bowl right and so the question is always like man how much can we sell this q4 we only have like six to eight weeks to burn through that inventory and so if we under order we're we leaving money on the table and what i've learned over the years is you're better off to leave some sales upside on the table rather than get stuck with a ton of inventory but there's also ways to kind of split the risk is what I, how I like to look at it is like, okay, maybe for a home run sales upside, you want to order this massive order, but it feels really risky because if you don't hit those sales projections, you're going to be stuck with a lot of cash sitting in your warehouse in the form of slow inventory. So what do we do instead? Can we split the difference and can we order, can we afford to order between our most current conservative and most aggressive forecasts? Or can we split the difference by saying, Hey, we're going to place one bigger order, but that we feel comfortable with. And then we're going to place like a couple smaller orders with our factory. And we're going to stage them out to get shipped over time. So that if we run out, we can tell customers, Hey, we've got a small order coming in seven days. And, and you have a much like much higher likelihood of like getting, um, you know, pre-orders taken. So that's just a little bit on that topic, but I could talk about inventory management all day in the D2C brand context. No, but I think that super valuable information right there. And I think the uh, the reason why that cash becomes so important is also like something to consider, right? So it's not just we're over ordering potentially if we're not thinking about, uh, you know, for, for lack of a better term, FOMO of like missing out on sales, but like, let's just assume you really missed the mark, right? And now you've got all this cash and inventory. 
it's also dollars that you can't use towards advertising or marketing mm -hmm. or promotional activities to actually make that uh you know that, that that inventory move as well so i think that's always just something to, to think about uh when you're on the uh, the d to c you know side of things there um i'd say one other question i have for you uh here comes from like uh, like predictability uh was interesting right so you mentioned uh getting your your inventory um uh supply chains kind of on point there but like how do you account for that from a cfl perspective you know if i'm a brand i'm, I'm growing quickly you know what are mm -hmm. the things i should be thinking about to to forecast things properly yeah so um rule number one of forecasts they're wrong they're always wrong they're not meant to be right they're meant to provide directional guidance and they're meant to give the way i like to explain it they're meant to give us guardrails right and they're also meant to help us understand what we would have to do to even hit those numbers. So let me give you an example. Saying that I'm going to grow year over year 100% is way different than saying in order to, to grow year over year 100%, I'd have to spend this much in ad dollars and I'd have to get this ROAS. And in order to spend that much in ad dollars, what would my incremental lift need to look like every week as I scale spend up? Have I ever hit this ROAS before at this scale? How different is a ROAS at double the spend versus what uh, versus what I've seen historically at half the spend? And so those um, kind of like analyses, they don't guarantee what you're going to hit. But now you're having a conversation instead of just saying, I'm going to double my revenue. You're having a conversation about some more granular drivers of like, what would it even take? And a lot of times when you're having those conversations, you can suss out how unreasonable or reasonable a, a growth target actually is. So it's more of like, it's more of building a model that actually connects cause and effect. Effect, outcome, that's the revenue number, right? But cause is like, how much are we going to spend? What's uh, how? What's the ROAS we're going to get? And you go even like a level deeper, what ads are we going to create to make that happen, right? And what kind of conversion rate what kind of traffic do we have to drive to those ads what kind of conversion rate do we need to see on those ads so when you build out a model that builds up those building blocks now you're having a conversation about like actual drivers and actual activities that you're going to try to execute and then additionally once you have that you can start looking at historical data and seeing how much of a lift you have to you have to drive in all of those activities to understand like Again, how reasonable it is, but then how quickly you need to take action and how disciplined you need to be with your action because there's nothing worse than saying, I'm going to double my revenue. You get to Black Friday and you don't nail it, but it's because you realize that you didn't have the ads ready to go and you weren't scaling your spend several weeks ahead of time, right? And like, oh, you can't do those things unless you build out models of those drivers that drive that end outcome from a forecast perspective. I think that's just extremely sharp. I know the way that we build out our forecasting models on our end when I'm looking at uh, at Amazon uh, is a combination of that, right? So I know, you know, if I build a 12 or 18 month modeling, like it's not going to be directly accurate, right? Or 100% accurate when it comes down to, to spend to rev. Um, but it does allow me to help our clients to plan out what should we be spending on a monthly basis, right? If we're trying to hit X target, you know, what does that look like on a 12 month basis of spend to revenue? Um, you know, what is that going to do to our PL at the end of the day? And then really, I love what you called out on the drivers um, there, you know, things like, okay, if we're driving outside traffic to Amazon, that does definitely create a multiplier, right? Um, and so we're going to scale faster, but now I have to factor in outside traffic, in my game plan for the year, right uh, there. I can't just say, oh, we're going to do outside traffic forecast all around it and then not actually implement something like that, right? Because it's going to screw up my, my whole year. Uh, totally, totally. One thing I always say is like, and I got this wrong. Don't get me wrong. I got this wrong at the, like in the earlier days of my career. That's how I, who I, does I made, yeah, who I made does the mistake. It was like, okay, this doesn't work that way. But I would say forecasts and projections don't grow a business actions grow a business, right? We build forecasts and projections to inform the actions that we need to take ahead of time. And then we go take disciplined action, right? And then we have check-in points. There has to be a feedback loop where you check in weekly, monthly. I, for brands that are growing, I, I suggest weekly at least, right? It's like checking in like, 
okay, I said, if I take these actions, these drivers are going to move and the movement of those drivers is going to drive this movement in revenue and profit. And you're checking in and weekly and seeing if that's actually happening. And you're kind of updating your plan in real time. But again, it's the, whenever I see a forecast that has numbers I don't like, or actually even more dangerously numbers I really do like, my question is, guys, what action are we going to take to make these numbers a reality? I think that's huge. Yeah, I like that. I, I like the uh, the check-in piece on the weekly basis too. So when you're thinking of forecasting, right, in, in your brain or for, you know, D2C brand, should they, be, should they be thinking about this on like forecasting for a month ahead of time? Should they be looking at six months, a year? You know, what is what is forecasting you know, look like in the, in the best case scenario there? So some of the best practices that I look look at and I consider and, and are kind of my go-tos. And, and again, keep this in mind. This is from the perspective of what I call three statement financial modeling. So that's that's modeling a, a forward looking profit and loss statement, cash flow statement, balance sheet, right? Um, really, and this is in the this is in the consumer brand D to C context, right? Is that like the further out that your forecast goes into the future? the less accurate it's going to be. And you should not spend a ton of time making it super accurate. You want, you want longer range forecasts to just be direct. You want them to head in the direction that you want to take the business. And you want to look at it more from a high level and what I'll call like a capacity planning standpoint. Like if you get to those numbers 12 months from now, is your factory even going to be able to keep up, right? Do you need to hire more people? It's more of a capacity planning you know, uh, discussion as well as like just high level, what margins would we have to achieve to hit certain profit targets or EBITDA targets or whatever. Right. Um, but then when you're, you're narrowing down in the closer time horizon, um, the closer we get today, the more that we need to try to be more accurate with our forecast and the greater the ability to be more accurate. It's again, it's never going to be perfect unless you're lucky. But you should try to make it, uh, the closer it is today, the more accurate we should should be able to make it with the data we have available. And in terms of like that shorter planning time horizon, I typically center it around the brand's manufacturing lead time. And it's because, so if you have a 90 day lead time, 90 days from today, right, is when we can receive inventory if I place an order today with the information that I have. So I want to really be very, very meticulous about what my profit and my cash flow projections look like during my manufacturing lead time, because I could potentially make a decision today that can affect me in 90 days, right? But if my manufacturing lead time is only 30 days, I'm really going to get most meticulous around the next 30 days, because if data changes, I, I, can, I can switch up my forecast really fast next month because I only have a 30-day lead time. So what the challenge is, is that the longer your lead time is, the harder it then gets to have really accurate forecasting during your manufacturing lead time horizon and the riskier your decisions are when you're making inventory decisions based on forecast. Because if you were to tell me like, hey, John, how much should I order? How much should this brand order? Well, if their lead time is 30 days, I have a pretty good feeling about what they're going to sell in the next 30 days, right? If their lead time, this happened to Guardian Bikes during COVID, our lead time, it skyrocketed from 90 days to a year. So now when I'm placing an order today, I'm asking my sales and marketing team, what are we going to do one year from now? And everyone's like, I don't know. And so in summary, the further out you get, the less accurate your forecast is going to be. And you want to think more about capacity planning, right? And and the, the shorter time horizon, you want to get way more detailed on. I typically like to line up with your manufacturing lead time because that's the horizon over which you're making inventory decisions, which are very capital and cash flow intensive. Yeah, just awesome information that makes so much sense um, logically. There, I uh, feel bad for one of our clients that has a uh, six month lead time. They're not they're not so hard right there in the year. Uh, but yeah, forecasting for us is a is a big part of uh, that account, just given the constraints that do come with that. Um, there, which is, which is cool. Uh, let's get a little bit more granular towards Amazon specifically. So, you know, for D2C brands, uh, when they're thinking about Amazon, you know, how does that change their financials? How does it change their kind of targets that you typically recommend for what they hit? You know, the typical PL, you know, what, what's changing from an Amazon account versus your own DDC? 
Yeah. So here's what's interesting. Um, again, I, we could probably, you and I could definitely talk about this for the next 40 minutes. And, um, but a lot of brands that I work with have two major channels, their .com, their Shopify store, their website, right. And then Amazon. And, um, the thing is, depending on what product you sell, well, a couple of things. One, first off, you have the platform fees you have to pay to Amazon, right? You got to pay them either 15 or 20%. And then if you're FBA, you're also paying the shipping fees. What it really comes down to um, from my perspective is that like you look at Amazon's platform fees as a marketing spend, as an ad spend, right? And you compare that back to your website because you know, it, it may cost 40% of every dollar in ad spend to get someone to convert on your site, but it may cost 15% in a cost like ad spend on Amazon. And then the Amazon fees only 15. So that's 30 versus 40. Amazon's more profitable in that, in that case. It's not the same for every brand. Some brands are more profitable on Amazon than they are in their own store. And some can achieve parity by messing with prices. Although Amazon makes that hard to, you know, mess with prices on your site versus Amazon. But that's the, that if you were to say like, John, what's like the one thing that people need to know about comparing profitability on Amazon versus their site is that look, Amazon can be as profitable or more profitable. If when you take into account the ad spend you spend on that platform, plus their platform fees, if that percentage of revenue is less than your website, then you quite likely are more profitable. And and honestly, what I tend to see, I tend to see that Amazon is, um, for a lot of brands, you're able to acquire customers for a lower cost because they're already on the platform. Whereas when you got your own website, you're maybe a nascent brand, you've got to build this brand new awareness, right? You got to spend a lot of money to build this brand new awareness and get people to come to your website and convert. Whereas when you're on Amazon, there's kind of already this like, hey, if you're on Amazon and you're selling Prime, you have the Amazon stamp of approval, right? You've got transparent, like, um, you know, reviews and everything right there. And so like you, people feel really confident buying from a brand new brand because they've got like basically the Amazon legitimacy. I think that's huge. And I love how you think of the FBA fees and the sort of referral fees on Amazon as a marketing cost, right? Uh, compared to your, your D to C. Uh, Cause really like, I tell brands the same thing, like 69% of all searches on Amazon don't include a brand name, right? So being able to leverage Amazon from a new customer acquisition perspective, totally. uh, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a huge channel there. Like 65% of all searches started on Amazon last year where Google's at like 20% plus, right? Uh, in regards yeah. to, uh, to product searches. So it really can, I think it's key, like, you know, to look at it from, uh, what your, what your goals are on Amazon, right? If you're doing a lot of, let's say overflow or it's branded, right? So you guys spend a lot on D to C, you know, maybe a lot on Facebook, typically stuff drives to your.com. Amazon might overflow. If you're very brand dependent, then I think looking at your margins are really important. Um, they're looking at your a cost is it, keeping that as low as possible is really important considering it's not a lot of stuff being driven on platform. But once you start winning on the non-branded, right, and that becomes your new customer acquisition vehicle, then it might make a little bit more sense to even have a higher acquisition cost, potentially, depending on what that looks like for you guys and, you know, an LTV basis and things like that. Um, totally. I'm curious for you guys, like, so Amazon, it's starting to get a little bit easier to get some of this data, but things like customer lifetime value, right? Uh, that's info that you typically have for .com, right, that you could probably use to help iron out acquisition costs and things like that. Uh, Amazon, historically, it's been harder to get that information. Uh, now it's getting a little bit easier to pull some of that info, but how does that impact you know, what you do in regards to like make recommendations on things like acquisition costs and stuff like that? Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, the data transparency thing, I would say like if there is like a single drawback um, to selling on Amazon versus your own website, it's the direct it's the having the direct relationship with your customer, right? And having and really having the transparency on what they're purchasing from you, right? Um, honestly, that one is like a really hard one to tackle. And there's like a lot of different tactics that I've seen 
you know, successfully used in the past. I'm sure you guys see this all the time. You know, one of them is like, Hey, can you put something in the box that gets someone to register their product on the, on your website? Right. So then you're like, okay, I know that you now have their email, you know, that they bought this product. You can now, you can now, um, reach out to them directly in terms of like trying to sell future products to them and things of that nature. So if, if there's some way to actually, uh, you typically can't do this on platform, or at least I know that I've heard that they're making some changes to the platform and that they're going to continue, but at least like in the earlier days of guardian bikes, we had to figure out what we could put in the box that would give someone an incentive to go sign up for some email list, register the product, something like that. And that's really where we we were able to then get some establish a direct relationship with that customer and drive LTV by putting them in our email drip campaigns and selling new products to them. Another thing that we've done now, this doesn't have as clear like data accountability, but um, you can look at some of like the company level metrics to try to measure if it does seem like it's lifting LTV and it's lifting sales and it's lifting margins. But another thing you can do is you can only offer a small limited SKU mix on Amazon, but have the full line on your website, right? And so what that does is if you get someone, uh, let's just say you put like maybe uh, maybe a flagship product that makes sense to uh, purchase some sort of consumables after the fact, right? Um having the flagship product available on Amazon, but the consumables on your website and having some way either via the actual packaging itself and, and an insert or something else to get them to come back to your site and purchase the full product line, right? And so what we eventually kind of did at Guardian Bikes, because this was just the economics of a bike. A bike is a really big bulky product, right? And so like FBA fees were not we we had much more aggressive uh, shipping discounts with our wear with our three PL than we could get with Amazon, and so we were taking a margin hit, but it was still profitable. But what we did is we we offered kind of some of like our entry level and not as popular SKUs on Amazon. So it gave us a second. We wanted to move that inventory, so it gave us like a second sales channel to to sell it through. But it also got people introduced to the brand. And we had a secret sauce, which was we had a patented brake system that prevented you from flipping over the handlebars. So if you got really sold on Guardian Bikes and our safer braking system, and you couldn't find the next size up on Amazon, there's a good chance you're going to come to our website and buy it from our website, right? So there, that's another tactic you could use to try to use Amazon as truly like an incremental a uh, customer acquisition channel, but then bring them back to your website and establish a direct relationship to try to drive LTV. Yeah, I love that you brought that strategy up. It's something that uh, I've done quite well in the past. Like I know uh, this brand in the pet space, we did the exact same thing. BarkBox, like they uh, they were doing fifty million a year on dot com and like almost nothing on Amazon. We decided let's launch some single SKU items on Amazon but sell just our subscriptions on, on, uh, on dot com and just saw a massive, massive list lift, right? Once we made Amazon work, we were doing, you know, went from zero to a million dollars a month and dot com went from 50 mil to 250 million during that same time frame, right? And it's because we gave them that, you know, separate selections, right? On what they could yeah. basically get from, uh, from that, which was, which was just massive for us. Um, yeah. And so, you know, it does get harder to like directly measure, measure attribution, right? But it's hard to do that anyways on your own website with like iOS 14 and everything. And so like there are ways to be calculated about like, I'm going to do this strategy on Amazon and I'm going to try to hold my .com funnel like fixed for a moment and see what lift happens. And you can prove out, you know, that like, hey, when I do this on Amazon and I do nothing else on my, on any other part of the funnel, website sales lift you can make the direct connection that they are right. absolutely connected. You may not be able to do it on an order by order basis, but you can directionally prove that it's adding incrementally to revenue and margin dollars. A hundred percent. You can start to see that correlation and it, it's a, on the reverse side too, like with brands. Uh, I mean, now there's some things you can use to attribute like outside traffic to Amazon, but historically it's been pretty hard, right? So one of the things I've done is like measured branded volume. So as Let's say, you know, anytime we run a campaign or a PR mm -hmm. or something outside of Amazon, we want to see a correlating lift and branded volume um, there as well, just to make sure that, you know, it's not perfect, but 
it does provide some predictability, right? Like, totally. like, like these are, these are directional pieces, but they're definitely directions that can, that can help us there uh, for sure. Um, I'd say for you, like, you know, when it comes to the uh, Amazon or D2C side of things, what are some like questions or problems that you see happen pretty frequently? And what are some of the ways that you work towards, you know, addressing maybe some of those questions or problems that you see? Yeah. So, um, I would say like, honestly, most frequently I get the question of like, how much can I afford to spend on advertising? And unfortunately the answer is always like, well, it depends. Right. And like, I'll kind of walk you through the, the, the logic that I use first off it's, it, it absolutely has to start with the goals and the strategy for the business. Like, it, it, it just doesn't make any sense to create an advertising strategy with targets until we talk about what's the goal and the strategy for the business. And every business is different. Like I, I work with some brands that it's a husband and wife that run it. They don't have any, like they're right now, they have no plans of selling the business. Their plan is to just make a good living, right? In a solid lifestyle business and sell products that they are really super passionate about. And so they really, their goal is like driving profit dollars so that they can take distributions out of the company. Right. Um, I work with other brands where they're trying to hit EBITDA targets because they want to get acquired. And that acquisition value is going to be that valuation is going to be valued as a multiple of EBITDA and not EBITDA percentages, you know, EBITDA margin percentage, EBITDA dollars. And so when, when, when I hear those two different end goals, that gives us two very different advertising strategies and targets to build to those end states, right? And so um, you got to start there. And then next, we have to really examine the company's uh, what's called contribution margin before ad spend to understand how much room we have for advertising. And so contribution margin, uh, you know, uh, oftentimes like, brands will measure gross margin, but gross margin just subtracts your cost of goods sold from your revenue. We need to go a step further and we need to subtract your fulfillment and your shipping costs to the customer. And then we need to subtract your credit card processing fees or in Amazon's case, their seller fees and their referral fees. Once you have that, then we know how many dollars we have available on every order to spend on advertising and then have some left over to cover our overhead and drop profit to the bottom line. And so um, I, I help brands dissect their contribution margins and then based on where they want to get with that end strategic goal and the time frame of like how long it takes to get there, that's where we'll decide how much to spend. So for example, and I'm sure you see the same thing, Daniel, in the Amazon world, like I've got one brand that has over 80% gross margins, their contribution margin before marketing is 71% of revenue. Super out of this world, healthy margin. Chunky. Yeah, that's chunky. Yeah. I like that. They, they can afford to get a two ROAS and can still make a lot of money. I know other brands that their contribution margin before marketing is 35% and a two ROAS, which would be 50% marketing spend, would put them out of business, right? And so it really, really depends on your contribution margins and your end and your end goal. And, and I would say additionally, and you could probably add to this is like, it depends on your product category and like how competitive it is, where in the funnel can you be successful? Like, do you have to do top of funnel awareness marketing off platform just to get people to Amazon? Cause no one even knows what you sell. Or is there enough awareness that you can really crush it at the bottom of the funnel by doing PPC, right? And so those two things are very different because when people are already in market, the row as you can hit is far different than if you have to get people aware of a brand new product or product category. And uh, I think that, that, that part's so huge there too, where it's like, uh, like I hear all the time, like, oh, well, I know this brand and they're doing X amount in volume, or this is the margins that they're dealing with. And like, yeah, you're right. They are doing it that much, but they've been selling for five years, right? Or they already have this much organic revenue that's built up. Um, and so I think it's really important to understand what category you're going in. Um, I love how in-depth you 
kind of go with with your kind of analysis there, uh, which is the way you should be thinking about it, right? If you don't have your proper goal set, if you don't really know what you're doing with the, you know, your D 2 C brand, all of these are just actions. They all of these are just like motions that you're going through without any like real gusto, right? Like at the end of the sure. day, like this is all about planning for the future, right? And then really executing against these plans. Uh, you know, just because I like if I set a forecast and if it doesn't hit. It's not like, oh, well, it doesn't, you know, it didn't hit whatever, right? It is, okay, we're not hitting this week or this month. What are we doing in the next day, week, month to mm-hmm. help us actually go and get back on track, right? And hit those goals. Um, totally. We need to have goals to to hit, you know, in order to, to run this. You know what else is interesting about how much you, like another big driver? I was just talking with this, the, about this the other day with, um, Justin Buckley from attention agency or not the other day, several weeks ago, but like, I think what I'm starting to see, and I'd love to get your take on this is that one of the reasons why food and beverage brands tend to do so much better on Amazon than on their own website is because the margins tend to be the contribution margins before marketing tend, this is an overgeneralization, but on average tend to be a lot thinner per order and in large part it's due to the package size and weight versus the aov the value of that product like i have a brand that has a 200 dollars aov and the and the 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 what they sell is super small so there's a huge spread between revenue and shipping cost right and so they can make their dot-com site work but i know other food and bev brands that they've only got like they have you know instead of like a hundred bucks that they can spend on marketing. They maybe have 25 bucks or maybe they have 10 bucks per unit. And it's in large part because their AOV is only 50 bucks instead of 200, but the shipping cost is the exact same as that brand that has a 200 AOV. Do you see? Oh yeah. Well, no. So that's, that's why like, if you look on Amazon or .com, everybody tries to get you into a multi-pack, right? These days, um, yep. there, and it's it's two reasons. One, it's stickier. So if I can get somebody into a multi-pack, there's a higher chance they're going to reorder because I usually uh, we're talking about replenishables. I've gotten more days, or I've gotten more days worth of items or more uses, uh, you know, per customer uh, sure. on a bigger pack size, right? So that that definitely is going to help again. Um, the other thing, then you nailed it, is price. So let's say I'm selling a vitamin, right? Uh, on Amazon, the average AOV for most vitamins is like anywhere between 1999 and 29.99 um, there, right? Versus on my .com, I'm going to be pushing them to a multi-pack, maybe a three-pack, maybe a five-pack, maybe some sort of subscription uh, sort of business. Um, this company, Hub Nutrition, for example, has one of the stickiest like uh, repeat purchases of any kind of brand there. And it's like direct on their own site. Cause there's so many things you can do for like card abandonment and all this fun stuff. Uh, Amazon though, like supplements are huge, right? And millions and millions and millions of, of supplements are sold every single day um, on, on Amazon there. Uh, why do those brands still compete is because the, the new customer acquisition component, right? And so if I can, even if I get you in on a single, I might not make a dollar on my single unit. Uh, I may have broke even, maybe even, uh, maybe even spent more money than the cost of the item, right? I could have spent $20 to acquire you and my items $19.99. But if I know that the average customer buys 10 times in a year, uh, then I'll make my, my money on the repeats, right? Because most customers yep. for food, uh, for beauty, they tend to be really sticky. Um, so if I can get you on a non-branded search term, hopefully you'll come back as long as the item you know, reviews well and things like that. For sure, for sure. Um, cool. Really fun stuff though. Uh, let's see, I guess, you know, I know we've could definitely go on and on for forever here, but I want to uh, definitely just leave some room for, uh, for any questions people have. And then uh, yeah. What is, uh, what's one piece of advice that you're giving to, you know, brands that you're talking to and any, any sort of consistent themes right now that you're seeing across the board uh, there? Yeah. Um... Well, I would say probably um, probably one of the most important things that I'm talking with brands about, and again, we're fractional CFOs for D, growing D to C brands specifically. And so this is unique to D to C, but the concept can be applied universal to any consumer brand. 
And that's that we have to always, if we want to grow, we need to always be marketing and we need to always be figuring out how to scale advertising because we're not going to just magically grow just organically. Certainly there's always an organic component to growth as there's more awareness in the market. Um, you know, word of mouth, maybe the product category has some wind in its sales, right? Things like that. But by by nature, D to C brands have to advertise to grow, right? And they have to scale advertising. So if if we have reached a plateau where spend is not scaling any further and our return on that spend is not improving, we are going to stop growing or at least growth is going to heavily slow. And so at that point, we have to ask ourselves, why is this happening? And what do we need to do to get back into a phase of scaling spend and maintaining returns on that spend? And so we can't just throw our hands up and go like, uh, it's not working anymore. Like we're just going to cut spend. I think I've, I've heard a ton of brands, both prospects and brands that I've, that I've worked with that after iOS 14 and after like the kind of COVID e-commerce boom, demand boom slowed down is like Facebook doesn't work anymore. That's not true. Um, it, you take any of the ad platforms, Google, Amazon advertising, like they still work, but you have to track how the consumer is changing, right? At the end of the day, advertising works when you actually clearly message a problem that you solve, right? And just because there's no such thing, I mean, this may be a little controversial, but there's no such thing as evergreen ads. Like that, like there just isn't. An ad could work, ad strategy, copy messaging can work for a long time, but eventually it all comes to an end and you've got to be ready for the next iteration, right? The next round of creative, the next round of products that need to be launched. Um, so anyways, I guess to summarize all that, what I've been telling brands is like, we, we have to always be marketing and we have to always be scaling marketing. If we don't, we will not grow anymore. D to C brands have to scale advertising to grow. I love that. I think it's just such great input uh, and it, it's so accurate. Like, you know, don't get me wrong. There's brands that, uh, that hit, right? They do well on organic sales. I remember one... Uh, one beauty brand in particular that uh, I worked with, Drunk Elephant, like when I first met them, they were like, oh, we don't advertise. That was just a thing. They never advertised on any other platform, right? But I convinced them like, look, you guys need to advertise on Amazon, right? It's just, this is the way this platform works. Like I know that you guys have seen success on all these other platforms without that. Um, and you know what? We went from $15,000 a month to $750,000 a month in six months, right? This was back in the day when Amazon was... Uh, you know, still really, really ripe and, and quick and easy, but uh, it just goes to show, right? Like even though these brands were so established, so fast growing, right? They still, you know, needed a refresh from time to time and, and marketing is always on. Um, I know there's a big Harvard study that they did uh, not during this recession, but the big recession in 2008 um, where they studied brands that uh, paused other advertisings during the mm -hmm. recession and ones that uh, actually moved deeper into it or, or kept it going. Right. And the average brand that kept advertising, um, they got out of the uh they got out of the recession like sixty-seven percent faster than or, or their growth was sixty-seven percent higher than those that shut it off, right, or turned it down. Um, totally. Well, you know what's interesting about that too? I've been getting I've been on a few webinars over the last few weeks and I keep getting the different versions of the question of like, what's your single piece of advice to help brands weather the storm, right? Yeah. The recession that that we're in or is coming. And, um, you know, I'm like, you got to be really good at marketing. And and here's the thing, just because it worked pre-recession doesn't mean it'll work during the recession or after the recession. What, what your job, you know, what are marketers supposed to do? They're supposed to understand their target market really, really well, understand what their needs and desires are and meet those needs and desires with their products. And so how do you weather the storm from a marketing perspective uh, in a recessionary environment? we can take the answer to that question in a lot of different directions, but generally speaking, you understand how your target market is changing as the environment changes and you adapt your marketing and the, and the problems you solve to the new version 
of their problems that they're experiencing during a recession. Yeah, I love that. And definitely seen, uh, seen some success with some similar strategies there, which is uh, always fun. Um, John, it's been super rad having you on board and, and sharing your, uh, your smartness here. Uh, how can uh, folks get in touch with you? Yeah, so um, LinkedIn as uh, Jonathan Blair, as you can see down the screen, J-O-N-A-T-H-O-N. Um, and our website is free to grow CFO.com. And I'll even throw it out there. Uh, email me John J O N at free to grow CFO.com. Um, would love to hear from anyone who's attending. Um, I'm always happy to be a, a, a helpful resource in any way and, um, appreciate everyone for joining. And John is, uh, just super sharp. Definitely helps us out with our, our own business here. So we definitely have the, uh, so a seal of approval from my man, John. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for sharing your time and uh, we'll definitely put some links out in the comments for you guys as well. Awesome. Great. All right. Later.